2 Corinthians 5, 17-21 in the King James Version of the Bible reads as follows. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now what I want to do this morning is to break this passage down and analyze it so we can better understand what it says to us. I don't want to start with the word reconciliation. You know, you've doubtless heard the expression, that's a horse of another color. Or that's a horse of a different color. And if you look up the phrase on the internet, the first reference you'll find will be to the usage of this phrase for a prolonged but barely amusing sight gag in the 1939 movie Wizard of Oz. But I assure you the phrase is much older than that. In writing, the expression could be tracked back at least as far as Shakespeare, who used the phrase horse of that color in Twelfth Night. But the saying is doubtless older still. Now, you all know the meaning of this trope, a horse of another color is a completely different matter. But one folk etymology of the phrase suggests that this imaginative saying has somewhat literal origins. Horses, especially thoroughbreds, are registered by color. And though the hair of horses can gray as they age, much like human hair does, the change is usually slight. So if someone is selling a horse and the animal in question does not match the animal on the registration because its, its coat is of a different color, chances are the animal on the auction block is a completely different animal from the one in the registration. Now according to this etymology, the phrase does not refer exclusively to equines, but was originally used to refer to the substitution or alteration of any hairy beast, because the old English word for hair is hoar, H-O-A-R. And any animal whose pelt or hide appeared to have been altered or was of an unusual appearance was said to have had hoars of another color. Now, what does that have to do with today's lesson. Well, as long as we're cobbling together back-formed etymologies in Latin, there are a number of words for hair. And one of them, the word for bristly hairs, like eyelashes, is the word cilia. In Italian, ciliate is to be covered with hair, or ciliate is to be covered with hair. And this is uh, brought over into English as the adjective ciliated. We use it to describe cells with little hair-like growths on them. Thus, literally speaking, conciliate means with hair, and reconciliate means with hair again, or with new hair, much in the same sense of a horse of another color. So etymologically, the word reconcile means to change, to exchange, in the sense of to alter, to make change, or to exchange one thing for another. Now the word reconcile has not been used that way for a long time. Indeed, that sense of the word was already archaic in 1611 when the King James Version of the Bible was translated. Nevertheless, Lancelot Andrews and his associates chose to use that word, reconcile, in the passage of, excuse me, in the, in the passage we read earlier, with the sense of to change. Now, when they translated this, what they meant by the word reconciliation was change 
and the sense of transformation. And we know this because the Greek word in question here, katonglage, uh, means to change or to exchange. But beloved, you know as well as I do that no one in 21st century English, uh, in the 21st century English speaking world, ever reads that passage and takes the word reconcile to mean transformation. No, to us, to reconcile means to bring into consonance or to bring into agreement. Now, excuse me, in 1611, the word reconcile also conveyed the sense of to bring into consonance. But, and this is very important, as this word was understood then, the action of bringing two things into consonance by reconciliation always and necessarily involved change. To reconcile meant to make one thing compatible with another, or to make consistent or congruous, or to bring into agreement. Now this is very important, because now, when we think of reconciliation, the congruity we imagine, the agreement we imagine, is not one of compatibility, but of tolerance. If you have a dispute with your neighbor and your neighbor proposes that the two of you reconcile your differences, you would not be anticipating that your neighbor had changed his position, and you know very well that you've not changed yours. No, what is much more likely is that what your neighbor is proposing is that the two of you agree to disagree. That you would both increase your tolerances for the differences between you. Now there's nothing wrong with that as far as it goes. Indeed, that's the very sort of thing that I think is in view in Romans 12, 18, where Paul tells us, to the extent possible, in so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. But make no mistake about it, that is not what Paul has in view in 2 Corinthians 5 when he speaks of reconciliation. No, to the degree that the Greek word uh, katonglage is properly translated reconciliation in that passage, the reconciliation that's in view is reconciliation of the sort carried out by an accountant. Now this is not an advertisement, although it could be. My wife Emily's sitting right here. If, if you were to bring your finances to Emily, who is a CPA, and ask her to reconcile your books, what she's going to attempt to do is to reconcile your books with reality. And unless you've been meticulous in your record keeping, that reconciliation is going to require that your books be changed. But newsflash, in accounting, reconciliation cannot be achieved by increasing one's tolerance for difference. No, numbers don't lie. Fuzzy math isn't math. It's fiction. And if you bring your books to Emily, she will eliminate the differences between what is recorded in your books and the actual state of your finances. And make no mistake about it, the changes that she makes will be unilateral. She will not attempt to change reality to conform to your books. No, she will attempt only to change your books to conform to reality. Beloved, that's what reconciliation, classically speaking, is. There is no reconciliation without change. And if one party to a reconciliation is unchangeable, that necessarily means that all the change will have to take place on behalf of the other party. Accordingly, when Paul speaks in 2 Corinthians 5 of reconciliation with God, it would be utter folly to imagine that what's in view in this transaction is that God will increase his tolerances for our differences with him. No. The only way for us to be reconciled with God is for the differences between us and him to be eliminated. And because God cannot be changed by anything outside of himself, that means that the change that makes reconciliation with God possible will be unilateral. In order for us to be reconciled with God, we must be changed. And with that in view, if I were translating 2 Corinthians 5, 17-21, I would not translate the word 
katanglage with the word reconcile, but with recreate. Thus the passage would rightly read, not that God is reconciling us to himself, but that God is recreating us in conformity with himself. As I've told you many times, grace is not God being nice. Grace is God being God in us. God does not change the judgment for us. Rather, he changes us for the judgment. Recreating us, changing us into creatures who will withstand the judgment, not just because we've been justified and will stand unaccused, but also, and more importantly for today's lesson, because on that day, we will stand fully sanctified. Not just counted sinless, but actually sinless before God. Now, if you want to hear more about that, I invite you to go online and listen to last week's lesson there. For the purposes of today's lesson, just know that the transformation that takes place in us when we are baptized is not merely a change in attitude, outlook, disposition, or behavior. Rather, we are changed constitutionally, body, spirit, and soul, into new creatures, the new humanity, homo novus. And this change is brought to us by the life substance of Christ at work in our hearts, in our cardia, which substance is charis, grace. That's what it means to be reconciled to God. Reconciliation with God isn't merely peace in the sense of the cessation of hostility toward God or the elimination of enmity with God. To be reconciled to God is to be recreated in conformity with God. And that, according to Paul, is what God is doing with us. As he also says in Colossians 1, 18 through 20, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to recreate all things in conformity to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross, which blood is literally coursing through the veins of you and me and every person possessed of the grace of Christ. And that isn't poetic language. That isn't a metaphor. No, now, I know I have preached on this fairly recently and very many times, but it bears repeating for the purposes of today's lesson. So, those of you who are familiar with my teaching, uh, bear with me over the next uh, three or four minutes. In Philippians 1, 3 through 7, Paul says to the saints at Philippi, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your reciprocation with me in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I am completely justified in feeling this way about all of you because I have you in my heart, both in my bonds and in my defense of the gospel, for you are all mutual partakers with me in grace. Now, when Paul says to the saints at Philippi that he has them in his heart, that, again, is not poetic. That's not just a way of saying that he loves them. Of that, I'm certain. Because if we were to take his words, I have you in my heart here to mean I love you, we'd have no choice but to intuit from what Paul says in these verses, either that Paul believes that his love for the Philippians stands as evidence of their salvation or that his love for them has the power to bring about their salvation. Neither of which propositions has any merit. Paul would never say such a thing. No, what Paul's doing here is making an argument. And the argument that he's making is that he who began a good work of salvation in the Philippians will carry it on to completion until the day of the Lord. And he gives two proofs to substantiate the argument. The first proof that he gives is in verse, uh, verses 3 through 5, where he offers into evidence the giving 
of the Philippians, in which is Paul seems to understand the matter, corroborates their status as joyous servants of Christ. And the second proof that he gives is in verse 7, where he offers into evidence his testimony that he has the Philippians in his heart, which testimony, as he presents it, completely justifies his confidence that the Philippians will all be perfected on the day of the Lord. And the only way that I can see for that to make any sense is if Paul is speaking literally when he says that he has the Philippians in his heart. As you all know very well by now, the Bible teaches that the indwelling of grace, the life of Christ at work in our mortal bodies, is a literal reality, a physical reality, a cardiopulmonary reality. Now, if there's anyone listening to this lesson who does not understand that, feel free to contact me and ask me for more information about that. For the purposes of today's lesson, we're taking that as a given. The Holy Spirit is living in every Christian as a bodily receipt, and the Spirit is not divided among us. He is shared among us. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 15 and 17, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? For everyone who is united with the Lord is of one spirit with him. And again, in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 13, Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts from one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized into one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. The Holy Spirit is not divided among us. The Spirit is shared among us. And we are the plenum of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ on earth. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, the, a plenum is the opposite of a vacuum. In physics, it's a space filled with matter as opposed to a space devoid of matter. In engineering, it's a closed system of containment and transmission, such as the air ducts of a forced air HVAC system. And in theology, or at least in my theology, it refers to the church, the body of Christ on earth, which is comprised of the bodies of Christians on earth, which bodies are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are the plenum in which the Spirit of Christ abides. And the one Spirit unites us into one being, into one organism, by inhabiting all of us at the same time. That's not unlike a similar reality that we all experience whenever we find ourselves in an enclosed space with other people, such as an elevator. Anytime you're in an elevator with other people, you're sharing a kind of unwilling intimacy with those people. This has particularly come to light in this last year with the COVID virus. Because everyone in that enclosed space is breathing out a variety of pathogens, and everyone else is breathing them in. And in that moment, the occupants of that closed space become the plenum for those path pathogens. Now that illustration is negative, but it wouldn't be negative if one of the people on the elevator were breathing out a pathogen that could heal all our diseases. And that, beloved, is exactly the reality that's presented to us in Scripture in regard to the Church, the Holy Spirit, and grace. The Spirit of Christ is the factor that makes the church a plenum rather than a vacuum. And the pathogen, which is afloat in the Spirit, the pathogen, which is airborne in this plenum, is grace. Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit into our bodies just as literally as God breathed the Spirit of life, the human spirit of Adam, into his body. And the permanent lading of the Spirit is grace. And the fellowship we have with one another in grace is just as intimate, just as tangible, just as tactile, just as real as the fellowship we have with pathogen-breathing strangers on an elevator. As a matter of fact, Peter and Paul both use that very word, the word pathema, from which we get the word pathogen to describe the power of grace at work within and among us. Philippians 3, 10 through 11, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his pathema, becoming like him in his death, 
that by this means I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. 2 Corinthians 1, 6-7 But if we are afflicted, it is for your calling and salvation, in which you receive the enduring energy of the same pathema, which we also experience. And if we are comforted, it is also for your calling and salvation. Thus our hope for you is steadfast. For we know that if you participate together with us in our pathema, that you also participate together with us in our calling. 1 Peter 4, 12-13 Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, for you are participating in the pathema of Christ, so that you may thrive when his glory is revealed. That's the reality of life together in Christ that's in view of Philippians 1. According to Paul, Christian participation in the grace of Jesus Christ is a deeply intimate, interspiritual, and interbodily experience. Grace does not come to believers in a vacuum. Grace comes to believers in a plenum, a plenum in which we all participate, a plenum in which we all comprise the plenum in which the Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts. And through that fellowship, we participate in one another's very beings, body and spirit. So when Paul says to the Philippians 1, 6 through 7, I'm completely confident that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And I know this for a fact because I have you in my heart. What he's testifying to is a reality that he is experiencing. The Philippians are in his heart. And as far as Paul is concerned, that stands as empirical evidence that they are in fact and in truth saved. That Christ is in fact that Christ in fact and in truth dwells in their hearts. Because the only way that they could possibly have come to reside in Paul's heart, the only way that their human spirits could possibly be cohabitating with his human spirit in his cardia is through co-participation in the pathema of grace, in the plenum of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. Which is exactly what Paul goes on to say in Philippians 1.7, I'm completely justified in feeling this way about all of you because I have you in my heart, both in my bonds and in my defense of the gospel, for you are all mutual participants together with me in grace. All Christians abide in one another precisely because Christ abides in us and in the same way that he abides in us. In John 15, 4, Jesus says, Abide in me even as I abide in you. And when he says that, he isn't just telling us to hang on to the vine for dear life. He's also, and more importantly for today's lesson, telling us what it means to abide in him. He is telling us what that reality looks like, what shape it takes. He's telling us in what sense we abide in him. According to Jesus, we abide in him in the same sense that he abides in us. Now, if that's right, if Jesus understands this reality correctly, and if I understand Jesus correctly here, what that means is that we abide in his heart in the same sense that he abides in our hearts and in the same sense that we abide in one another's hearts, through the pathema of grace in the plenum of the church. That is the spiritual and literal reality of abiding in Christ, and there's nothing figurative about it. After all, where is the body of Christ? The physical body of Christ right now. Remember, the tomb was empty. The testimony of the apostles is not that the body of Christ died, but his spirit lived on. No, the testimony of the apostles is that Jesus rose from the dead, body and spirit. Now, his body was changed. It was glorified. As Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 42-44, so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. 
For just as surely as there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So the body of Christ is different now than it was when he died, but make no mistake about it, it's still his body, and according to the Bible, he's still in it. He didn't leave it behind when he ascended to the heavenly places. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning over the inaugurated kingdom of God in glorified flesh. And whatever that body is like, if I understand John 15, 4 correctly, then that body has within it a heart. The heart of Jesus. And his heart, his cardia, is inhabited by us just as surely as our hearts are inhabited by him and in the same way, in the same sense that our hearts are inhabited by him, through the pathema of grace, the plenum of the Holy Spirit in the church. And that is the reality to which Paul hearkens next in the passage under discussion today, 2 Corinthians 5, 17-21. So here ends the review for those of you who are familiar with what I had just said, and sorry, it was much longer than three or four minutes. Nevertheless, because in 2 Corinthians 5, after telling us that we are new creations in the making, who are being recreated in conformity with God, he tells us that we have been given the ministry of recreation, which ministry is empowered by the literal indwelling of Christ in our bodies. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ is recreating us in conformity with himself and has made us stewards of the ministry of recreation. That is, in Christ, God has been recreating the world in conformity with himself, setting their trespasses in abeyance, and has deposited in us the word of recreation himself. Now here, many translations read very differently. The NIV says, He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. The ESV entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. The ERV reads, And he gave us this message of peace to tell people. And the GW has, And he has given us this message of restored relationships to tell others. And every one of those translations is so watered down and so far off the mark, it's disheartening. And this is why I've gone to such great lengths over the last several weeks to demonstrate to you that the gospel that we have received, that we are now delivering to others, consists of much more than information. It has to. Because the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And there are millions upon millions of people who are possessed of the basic information of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but yet do not possess the power of God for salvation. And Paul bears that out here in 2 Corinthians 5. And what he tells us is not that we have been entrusted with the message of restored relationship to tell others. Not even close. No, the Greek word that these translations have rendered message is the word logos. The same word John uses in John 1.1 1, 1, where he says, In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. And the word that's translated committed or entrusted or given to the word uh, is the word tithemi, which means to set, to put, to place, to place in, to make, to fix, or to establish. Accordingly, what Paul says in this passage, literally rendered, is that God has placed the word of recreation in us. And what that means to me is that the grace of Christ made incarnate in our flesh by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is at work in us, not just transforming us into new creatures, but transforming the world around us into a new creation through us. Therefore, 
If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ is recreating us in conformity with himself and has made us stewards of the ministry of recreation. That is, in Christ, God has been recreating the world in conformity with himself, setting their trespasses in abeyance, and has deposited in us the word of recreation himself. And then Paul goes on in verse 20 to characterize our stance as the couriers of this divine deposit. And here in 2 Corinthians 5.20, I take exception with almost every translation I've been able to track down. Now, there are a number of translator, uh, translators who make the claim that their translation is a pure translation, that they've not interpreted the Bible, but have only translated it, and that interpretation is the job of theologians. But, beloved, that is self-deception at its worst. Every word of the Bible, Hebrew and Greek, has an area of meaning which present the translator with a number of choices. <clears throat> and the choices made by the translators are guided by a number of things, and their theology is one of those things. It has to be. Any translator that claims that his or her translation is free of theological influence is not to be trusted because that's a claim that simply cannot be true. Because anyone who knows enough about Biblical Hebrew or Greek to be able to translate the Bible definitely has a theological point of view, and to deny this is the height of absurdity. And because I'm aware of this, I find it really disheartening that so many translators have rendered 2 Corinthians 5.20 in such a way so as to portray God as a beggar. The ESV here reads, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And the HCSB says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, certain that God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And if that weren't bad enough, the CEB reads, So we are ambassadors who represent Christ. God is negotiating with you through us. We beg you as Christ's representatives, be reconciled to God. And the CEV says, We were sent to speak for Christ and God is begging you, listen to our message. We speak for Christ and sincerely ask you to make peace with God. And the message, not surprisingly, goes completely off the rails here, missing the mark by a mile, rendering this passage, God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. But if you take any of these and drop them into the text that I've already translated for you in 2 Corinthians 5, 17-19, you won't be able to make a lick of sense out of verse 20. By the way, a lick is an actual unit of measure used by bartenders and pharmacists in ancient Rome. A lick is a fluid measure equal to about 30 milliliters or one third of a fluid ounce, uh, one third of a fluid ounce, which is about a quarter of a jigger or three quarters of a communion cup. Now, I don't know how that translates to measurements of, of sense. But however much sense a lick is, I assure you that making that much of it from any translation of 2 Corinthians 5.20 that portrays God as a beggar is impossible. And if verse 20 of 2 Corinthians 5 knocks you off balance, verse 21 will knock you completely on your backside. So I think it's really important to get 2 Corinthians 5.20 right here. And in my opinion, this verse ought to be translated, 
we are process servers of Christ. God issues subpoenas through us and we have served you with a summons on behalf of Christ, ordering you to submit to being recreated in conformity with God. And I, I invite anyone to, uh, who is listening to this lesson right now to double check that translation word for word using the Liddell Scott lexicon. I guarantee it will stand up under, under scrutiny. And when you put that together with what I've given you from this passage so far, it reads, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ is recreating us in conformity with himself and has made us stewards of the ministry of recreation. That is, in Christ, God has been recreating the world in conformity with himself, setting their trespasses in abeyance, and has deposited in us the word of recreation himself. We are the process servers of Christ. God issues subpoenas through us, and we have served you with a summons on behalf of Christ, ordering you to submit to being recreated in conformity with God. Beloved, we are new creatures, the new humankind, homo novus, and we carry in our bodies the deposit of the word of recreation, which deposit, when held aloft, presents itself as a divine summons, ordering all who receive it to report to the king of creation and surrender themselves forthwith, body, spirit, and soul, to his will, that he may do with them as he pleases, now and forevermore. Now that is a horse of another color from the usual picture we get. From this passage of a God who is sitting forlorn by the telephone waiting anxiously for the lost to call like a war widow whose husband is MIA. But it's only with this understanding of 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20 in view that we can even hope to make sense of 2 Corinthians 5, 21, a passage that has been giving people fits since it was written some 1950 years ago, largely in my assessment because they failed to grasp verses 17 through 20 aright. But it's my hope that by this time next week, because of all the work that we've done this week, all of us will have a much firmer grasp on what Paul means when he says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But I've given you quite enough to chew on for the week to come without even attempting to introduce next week's lesson now. So that's where we'll pick up next week. And that's my lesson for today.